The goal of this talk is to cover a lot of different things and scratch the surface and present you things that you can be interested in learning more about. The last slide will have a link to a post that links to a lot more details on all of the topics I'm covering. Uh, so really, my goal is to get you interested to learn more. I will not be able to properly teach and, and cover all the details of the various things I'm covering. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to tweet me. Hope to see you in person next year. So I'm Alex. Day to day, I work at Cognite for the office of the CTO, where I do a lot of database related things. I used to spend most of my career so far on Elasticsearch, uh, but Postgres remains one of my favorite tools. But you're not really here to learn about me, and we have a lot of ground to cover. So uh, we're just going to get started. Generate series is a utility that makes it very easy to quickly make a lot of dummy data. And having a lot of data is very useful to understand how your queries will behave or change behavior as the amount of data in the, your tables and indexes change. With generate series, you just tell it the start and the end and optionally a uh, delta, and it'll generate a lot of rows in that range. So in the example on the right, we just insert 100 rows into this very simple table. And then we create a different table with a million rows, and we can see that it only takes a few seconds. So throughout the slides, these, uh, this hash indicates that we're running a command in the uh, psql shell. And um, of course, the, these things would be outputs. Explain is the interface to ask Postgres to show details about exactly how a query will execute or has executed. By prefixing your query with explain, Postgres will show the plan of how it will perform this, this query without executing it. And if you tack on analyze after explain, uh, Postgres will execute the query while also profiling it and showing the plan with the profiling information. So in the uh, right, we have a query where we first just get the plan and then get the plan with the profiling information. For this particular query, Postgres has chosen to scan the entire table and then filter on the rows. We created a table here with only uh, 100 rows in it, and we haven't created any indexes yet. So this is pretty much the only plan Postgres can make at this stage. So it scans the entire table using a full table scan or sequential scan, and then just filters these. And we see that, of course, most of the rows have been removed by that filter. Now, let's create an index on this column and see what happens. So here we run explain with uh, some options such as verbose and buffers, which show us a bit more information on what happens. And um, even though we created an index on this ID column, we can see that Postgres still chooses to not use it. And by looking at the, the um, buffers, we get a clue as to why, because uh, Postgres has realized that there is so little data in this table at this point that using an index isn't really going to help. It's impossible to beat a plan where only a single uh, page has been read. Next, we'll see what happens if we change some settings. So we can essentially override this planner setting and say, hey, um, we're going to force you, Postgres, to, to not do a sequential scans unless you absolutely have to. So by flipping this uh, switch and then running the same query, we see that uh, now Postgres does use this index, but it actually hits uh, even more buffers because, well, in the previous plan, everything fit within a single page. Then let's add some more data into this table. 
uh, using generate series to quickly do that. We revert the uh, enable sex scan setting to its default setting. And now Postgres knows that there is a lot more than 100 rows in this table. Uh, so now it's going to pick a plan which involves the, the index even though we aren't forcing it to. Uh, next, we're going to uh, drop the index. That'll force Postgres to do a sequential scan. And by uh, running explain again, this time we have uh, a million rows in this table. We see that uh, Postgres has, has chosen to do uh, yet a, a different plan. Uh, it'll uh, do a parallel table or a sequential scan where it, it spins up multiple processes to do this in parallel. So in these simple examples, we have seen how uh, query plans can change as indexes and amounts of data changes. It can be fairly tricky spotting the uh, exact issue in just a, a textual plan, especially when these plans grow large. And there are uh, several great tools available to uh, visualize these. So um, here's a, a link to, to two different tools uh, that are worth checking out. In addition to uh, getting the query plans for uh, just plain selects, we can also do uh, explains on write operations. In this small example, we uh, create two tables and we insert uh, a million rows into uh, both of them. And there is a key from bar pointing to foo and then we see that deleting from bar is is pretty fast but deleting from foo is pretty slow and we want to find out why which might be fairly obvious in this simple example uh, but here we can see what explain looks like if we, we do it on a write query. So uh, keep in mind that analyze means execute. So explain analyze on a delete will uh, cause the uh, delete to go through. So, so keep that in mind uh, and, and optionally wrap your uh, test in a transaction if you do not actually want to delete it. Uh, but here we see that the, the delete on foo is pretty fast in identifying the record uh, within foo that happens with a uh, index scan. Uh, but then this trigger that causes the cascading delete to happen on bar uh, takes a long time. Uh, we don't see exactly the plan that happens within this trigger. But in this case, it's pretty simple to, to realize that, well, there is no index on um, the foo column on the bar table. So uh, Postgres will need to scan through the entire table to do this uh, cascading delete. So explain and explain analyze is something we will use uh, several times throughout this presentation to, to see kind of how things change as the amounts of data changes. It is, uh, you've probably used this tool uh, in the past, especially to debug performance problems in production maybe to find missing indexes. But I think it's very important to get explain and explain analyze kind of into your muscle memory and use it all the time. Also when you're developing in your local development environment, uh, because getting an understanding of exactly how Postgres executes things, as uh, available indexes change, as the amounts and magnitudes of data changes over time, that'll uh, give you a much better idea of, of how to avoid performance problems in the uh, first place. And you'll come across a lot of different node types, like the the uh, specific executor nodes that Postgres uses to do to perform your query and uh, understanding better how they work and, and how they change as you change different settings will massively help in, in better understanding how the database works behind the scenes. The uh, first thing we covered on generate series is a pretty simple way to quickly generate large-ish datasets.
in in my mind, if you don't know how your query executes with a few tens of millions of rows in your tables, you don't really know how it's going to perform outside of your development environment. So uh, always be using large-ish datasets. And uh, we can also do explains on updates and deletes and not just uh, selects. So explain your queries always, also when developing, and you'll have a much better intuition of how the database works. Returning is something you can add to the end of uh, data modifying statements like insert, update, and delete to get back exactly what changed. So here we create a very simple table, then we insert into it, and then we do returning. Returning can take star, which of course will return everything. You can also select particular columns. And here you can see that this auto-generated identity column is included in the uh, result. So that's an example of insert into with returning, but uh, update and delete can have returning as well. And here is an example where the uh, two particular columns are returned for whatever we did update. And in the last example, the returning is just returning the ID of whatever we just deleted. And we'll uh, return to returning in a few slides. But before we do that, we are going to talk about with expressions, also called uh, common table expressions or just CTEs as shorthand. To cover common table expressions, we will be dealing with this uh, tiny uh, data set that represent the edges of a small graph. It's a directed graph that happens to not just be a tree structure. In the bottom, we have three uh, quick tips for psql, the command line. So with uh, copy, you can pipe the output of what you get through a program. In this case, I generate GraphWiz of the uh, input and pipe it straight to GraphWiz to generate the graph in the top right corner, which is a lot easier for humans to use to visualize a graph, of course. Uh, copy can also emit data straight to uh, CSVs. In uh, the second example, we just create a file out of it. Uh, one thing I often use is, is pipe the output of copy to uh, PB copy on a Mac that essentially puts the output straight into your clipboard, which you can then, for example, paste straight into Google Sheets as a CSV. Uh, with queries or common table expressions essentially let you create uh, virtual tables. These the output of these selects can be referred to by later table expressions or in the final query as if it was a table. Uh, so in this case, we are essentially getting both the in degree and the out degree of all the different nodes in this uh, tiny sample graph. The different table expressions uh, that alias the output of a query uh, can be treated as if they were a table later. So here we pretty much do a full outer join on the update of, of these uh, two queries that uh, each of them aggregate the outer and the in degree on the graph. And you could, of course, use a subselect to achieve uh, exactly the same. These two queries generate the same output. Um, it's pretty much a, a matter of, of personal preference, I guess. I find the query on the left easier to read than, than the subselect on, on the right here. And also it's it's a bit easier on with the query on the left to kind of add more filters. So in, in with the subselect, you need to uh, repeat the same thing. Uh, whereas with the uh, table expression, it will inline the filters as necessary in the uh, table expressions defined up. And when I say that these two queries are equivalent, we can 
use explain to get a sense of just how equivalent they are because they clearly generate the same output, but will they actually execute in the same manner? And um, here is explain run on the uh, output of the uh, table expression approach. And if you do the uh, same explain on, on the subselect, we actually find that the plans are identical. So Postgres does rewrite the queries internally and end up with the same execution plan. Uh, this applies from Postgres 12 and up, up until Postgres uh, 11, the uh, plans would not have been the same because uh, up until 11, Postgres would always materialize the result of a table expression either to memory or disk uh, and not support kind of inlining uh, later filters. So in, in this example, we, um, we have the table we defined earlier with a million numbers in them. And um, with Postgres 11, if we did this the query, Postgres would first materialize a million numbers as the entire output of uh, A and then do a uh, select with a filter uh, on just two records afterwards. This is clearly a very inefficient way to get two rows out of a table. Uh, whereas uh, Postgres 12 will inline, like push through the filter into the inner table expression. And, and that is an important uh, distinction from more modern Postgres than uh, a few older versions. And this is important to keep in mind if you read about uh, blog posts in the past warning about common table expressions as optimization barriers. Uh, those can be a feature, but also a problem depending on, on what you need to do. So here uh, we force materialization. So this applies from Postgres 12 and up. So in, in this example, we are uh, forcing Postgres to work with very little memory in, in, in the top. You'd never have this artificially low limit uh, in, in real life, I hope not, but uh, we are kind of forcing disk flushing to happen a lot with this uh, tiny limit. With the query where we force the materialization, we see that uh, it's writing a lot of temporary files because when uh, Postgres can't fit things in memory, it'll spill to disk. Uh, so it reads the in entire table and writes it to a temporary files and, and then filters it. And this is, of course, taking a long time and it's, it's very inefficient. But if we do not materialized, which is the default behavior from 12 and up. We see that the plan, even here with a very small amount of, of memory allowed, the, the filter just pushes through and into the uh, table expression, and it becomes a very quick uh, index lookup as you would expect. So the query executes as if this where clause in the outer uh, select was in fact in line in the definition of the table expression. In addition to uh, selects, table expressions can also be defined with uh, data modifying statements like delete, update, and insert. They can also have a returning and therefore be referred to as uh, tables in subsequent selects or table expressions. Returning is the only way to let other table expressions in the same statement know of the results of your um, modification. So in this particular example, if we do with moved rows, delete from uh, returning, then the uh, products that match the expression and get deleted will be uh, what is contained in, in move rows. And the uh, query will then insert that into a different table. So that's a way to uh, move data between tables in a single 
expression. Note that if the uh, last query, instead of doing an insert select from moved rows, if it instead had done select from uh, products, uh, it would not have actually noticed the fact that products had been deleted uh, because again, returning is the only way where you can uh, communicate changes uh, across the different table expressions. The changes done by the delete is not visible to the same statement essentially. So um, I'm emphasizing this because this has confused me a bit in the past, causing for some strange to chase down uh, problems. So remember uh, returning. We will get um, back to a more um, powerful example of writable common table expressions later, but we need to introduce some other concepts before we uh, tackle that case. Common table expressions can also be recursive. A recursive table expression has two parts. One is uh, the query or the select that happens before the union or union all that seeds the subsequent iteration. And then there is an iterative query after the union that keeps on uh, being executed until it no longer returns any results. So while uh, it's called recursion, in practice it's, it's actually iteration. So uh, this of course just returns the sum of all the first hundred uh, numbers. A more useful example is traversing a graph that essentially becomes a breadth first traversal. So here we have the uh, same graph as earlier. There's uh, two parts to the recursive query, the purple part, which defines the uh, seed of the subsequent traversal. So the uh, purple part of the query just uh, finds the two edges going out of the root node. So both those get a uh, depth of zero and just root as the uh, half. And then the orange part will keep running uh, until it no longer produces anything. And the highlighted graph traversal inside the orange thing essentially becomes uh, self-join. So this query essentially just keeps on adding new edges uh, to the discovered edges with their path and their depths until there uh, are no more edges to discover. Uh, this particular graph does not have a cycle, but the filter there that uh, ensures that um, what we traverse into should not have been seen prior so far would prevent us from getting stuck in a cycle. While this isn't necessarily something I'd recommend running on your production database, people have fun making all kinds of things with uh, recursive queries. So here's a Mandelbrot set. And uh, I've seen someone create a ray tracer in recursive SQL as well. Uh, yeah, so. You can do lots of crazy things with uh, common table expressions. When you have a production database that is uh, acting up, it's useful to get a sense of what is going on right now in the database and, and what's causing it. And also over time, what has been happening and possibly uh, been the cause of slowness. PG stat activity is a built-in view that dumps the state of the various processes uh, Postgres is running that will emit useful information like which other clients are connected, are they currently running a query, is that query waiting for something such as a lock, is the uh, connection idle or idle in a transaction, is there a background process doing vacuum, that is cleanup of the database? So pgstat activity can show you what's going on right now. To make it easier to know what the source of 
a particular activity is, you can configure the application name of your uh, client. Sometimes this can be configured directly in the uh, connection string, but you can also use a set application name to, to configure this. So pgstat activity uh, indicates what's going on right now. If you need to terminate or, or kill some badly behaving connection, uh, you can use per, uh, pg terminate backend and then the uh, process ID of the backend to kill that connection. There is an extension called pgstat statements, which is super useful to get a sense of what has happened. It tracks the uh, most expensive or most frequently run queries over time. Uh, you can install it as an extension. I recommend installing it in all your databases. Postgres has this concept of template databases from which uh, all the future databases get created from. So if you install it in this template one special database, then you'll have this uh, extension on all created databases in the future. pgstat statements collects the uh, queries and statements that have run and tracks the number of calls, the total time, the average time, number of rows affected, how much IO it generates, reads and writes. And it's definitely one of the most useful extensions you can have. If you find that your uh, pgstat statements gets filled up by very similar looking but slightly different queries, it might be because you have some uh, SQL toolkit that is generating uh, SQL that is, is suboptimal. So I've seen this in, in some of our production environments where some client is essentially uh, preparing tons of thousands of different combinations of like numbers of parameters. So if pgstat statements in your case is full of this stuff, uh, I'd recommend chasing uh, cleaning up the, the SQL generated in those toolkits so you actually get something useful in uh, these um, views. If something is blocking other clients, it's very often because of locks. So pgstat activity can give you an indication of that. And excessive locking is often a side effect of doing migrations, changing tables, adding indexes, these kinds of things. So here is one uh, imagined example where we have three different clients and we have client A, which starts out with creating an index on the table person. It does this in a transaction, which uh, doesn't commit yet. In Postgres, data definition language like creating tables, changing them, creating indexes and so on, all happen in a single transaction. Unlike certain other databases, create table does not imply commit. Uh, implied commits really isn't a, a thing in, in Postgres. Uh, so you can definitely do uh, changes to your tables atomically in a single transaction. So we have a client A, which creates an index, and client B is attempting to uh, read from the table. Uh, which is allowed, but then it gets blocked on updating because this create index is, is having a lock on the table, which prevents other uh, clients from writing. And this can be absurd from client C. So we query the PG stat activity view and find active uh, processes that isn't our own process. And we find that client a is pretty much just waiting for this PG sleep, which can be a, a useful tool to kind of add to your migration files while, while testing to kind of simulate slowness, um, which might be easier with your tooling than just not committing the or rollbacking the transaction. And we can see from client C that client B is waiting on a lock. So uh, client B cannot progress until client A uh, commits or aborts its transaction, which in turn releases the lock. 
So create index prevents writes on the target table and locks are released only on commits and rollbacks. There are other uh, things that will need locks as well. In general, when you compose your uh, migrations, your like alter and create index statements and so on, uh, it's, it's recommended to, to understand what kind of locks they require. Because exclusive locks will pretty much block all concurrent access to the table, which will be perceived by other clients as a complete outage. While a share lock, which create index um, requires, will block all uh, write access to the table during the duration of the transaction creating the index. So that is not as bad as a full outage, but it puts your application in read-only mode. And with locks in Postgres, waiting for a lock is as blocky as uh, holding a lock uh, when observed from uh, other clients. So if you have a lock in the lock queue for an exclusive lock, uh, it just existing on the queue at all is as blocky as you actually getting the lock. So uh, when applying things in, in production, uh, it can be a good idea to have uh, lock timeouts and, and stuff like that. So if you need to wait for a long time to get an exclusive lock for some reason, then uh, you can error out early so you don't have a full on outage. Or a lot of um, migrations, Postgres does offer a less lucky alternative. So for create index, there is a create index concurrently, which uses a different algorithm to build the index. The trade-off is that it consumes more IO. It needs to read the table twice and it cannot be done uh, within uh, a transaction. It must the it needs to be the only operation in its own transaction. But creating next concurrently can definitely be very useful uh, to uh, be aware of because if you need to create an index in prod and you do not want to have a maintenance window uh, during which uh, write operations will be blocked and you're okay with the increased IO cost and the create index concurrently uh, can, can solve those problems. If you need to add a constraint, you can use alter table add constraint, uh, but unless you declare it as not valid, uh, Postgres will go ahead and scan the entire table while it's holding an exclusive lock on the table. Um, if your table is a terabyte worth of data, then you have a full outage on that table while Postgres is scanning it. So in this operation can instead be split into uh, two operations. So you can add the constraint as not valid and subsequently uh, validate the constraint. And adding the constraint as not valid will then require an exclusive lock, but only for a few milliseconds. And the subsequent validate will then uh, be able to run without the exclusive lock while it's it's scanning the entire table. So here is an example where we have an equipment table. It's pretty tiny, it only has two rows, uh, but uh, we show an example where we uh, add the constraint, a check constraint that mass cannot be negative, and we declare that it is not valid. And um, after that, we try to insert equipment with uh, negative mass, which the currently invalid constraint will still reject. So new data has to confirm to, to that uh, uh, constraint. And we see that the uh, subsequent attempt to validate it fails because it recognizes that there is uh, invalid data in the table. But at least uh, finding that happens without having an exclusive lock. In the uh, blog post that will accompany this talk, there will be a lot of links to uh, material that go in greater depth 
at the things I've just scratched the surface on. And I want to explicitly call out this post from Braintree on doing live changes to production database without downtime. In practice, uh, covering a lot of these things I just mentioned, such as create index concurrently and splitting up uh, adding constraints into multiple operations that are very aware of their locks. But this uh, post is a gold mine on uh, anything related to schema changes in Postgres. When you add data to a table, the constraints on that table will be uh, validated right after the statement that inserts data into it. Sometimes it's useful to defer a constraint to be validated to the time of attempting to commit the transaction. This can be done by marking a constraint or like a foreign key reference as deferrable. That makes it possible to defer it. And you can also mark it as initially deferred, meaning that without setting anything uh, in particular, on the transaction, the constraint will default to being deferred. This can be uh, useful for uh, cyclic foreign keys, where you essentially declare that you have to have data in both tables to be able to have table in any of them. Um, sometimes useful, for example, to make sure that uh, a, some vertically partitioned table uh, has data as well. And uh, the example here being a table that tracks change info, uh, where you might have a trigger where you uh, keep updating the last modified timestamp when something changes, which if you have an index on that, uh, will invalidate um, keep only tuples or hot updates on your main table. So essentially, if you have a large-ish table with a lot of different indexes and you always update an indexed uh, timestamp column, then it's probably worth extracting that to its own table so we don't cause a lot of uh, more expensive updates on all the other indexes as well. So uh, heap-only tuples is uh, worth searching for in the uh, accompanying post to learn more about cost of updating heavily indexed tables. So here's a concrete example where we insert into a table uh, in a single statement transaction, so that just immediately fails. Uh, but if we uh, start an explicit transaction and then insert into both tables, the uh, constraint will validate on commit. But if we uh, start a transaction and only insert into one of them and then commit again, uh, then at commit the uh, constraint fails. So that's uh, deferrable constraints. Indexes in Postgres can be uh, defined on the output of a function. Here is an example where we create a unique index on the lowercase of a username. So we guarantee that two users cannot have conflicting uh, usernames if they're lowercase. When using a functional index uh, read time to, to uh, do a lookup, you have to use the same function. So on the right hand, we see that the first example where the filter does lower username as well, that can use the index, whereas a lookup just on username cannot use that index. Indexes can also be partial. Partial means uh, that the index is only defined where certain clauses are true. Here is an example where we have a table assets where uh, an external ID has to be unique unless it's uh, soft deleted. So similarly with functional indexes, if you have a partial index, the clauses, in this case deleted at is null, must appear when you attempt to uh, do a query to be able to use that index. So in the uh, second example where 
the deleted at is null, is not present in the word classes, the index cannot be used. Uniqueness constraints are a pretty common example of a constraint that needs an index to function, and we just looked at how it could make that uh, partial. Postgres has very powerful support for uh, something called range types, which in turn can be used to uh, generate exclusion constraints. A range is an interval of numeric like data. So you can, of course, have ranges of, uh, say, 0 to 10, uh, where the start tends to be uh, inclusive and the end uh, exclusive. Uh, very useful is having ranges on timestamp data. Uh, ranges can be open-ended. Uh, so this example of a timestamp range from uh, that says now to uh, null means uh, essentially now until open-ended, which means uh, any time greater than or equals to now. Indexes that can uh, do range types, such as the uh, generalized search tree or gist index type, um, add support for uh, efficient overlaps and containment filters. So uh, two overlapping ranges, uh, well, overlap if they have anything in common, and you can also do contains on just a single data point or contains to check if an entire range is contained within. In the example on the right, we create a table intervals and generate a million random intervals with a generate series again. And uh, then we create an index on this uh, table uh, using a range over start and end, uh, making sure to specify gist as the index type. That enables us to uh, efficiently query the intervals table and on overlapping ranges. So here we find all the uh, intervals that overlap with uh, uh, now and one week into the future. With the ability to efficiently do lookups on ranges overlapping, uh, it is possible to use that ability to also define constraints. An exclusion constraint is essentially a list of uh, data and uh, operators on them. So in the example on the right, we create a table of reservations where a reservation uh, happens in a room in a certain time interval, and we declare the constraint no double booking as a um, list of uh, checks where the uh, room needs to be the same and uh, timestamps overlapping, or in the exclusion context, this means that no rooms can have overlapping uh, timestamps. So uh, we insert in the bottom a few reservations that do not overlap. Uh, and then we attempt to insert one that does overlap with some of these existing uh, reservations. Uh, note that these uh, constraints cannot be added concurrently uh, to a table. So you will need a, a maintenance window to be able to create uh, exclusion constraints if you grew create them after you initially create the table. Uh, with exclusion constraints, you can also define constraints where uh, something has to be the same. So it's essentially exclude uh, dissimilar items. So the uh, example here, we create a table cages where we have various cages and what animal to put in them and in which range. So uh, we see that we can insert um, humans and, and lions in, in different cages, uh, but we cannot put a lion and a human in the same cage at the same time. Uh, absurd is the action of inserting or updating something based on whether it already exists. Some databases call this uh, merge or replace. Uh, in Postgres, it's uh, an on-conflict option to uh, insert. You can decide, given a conflict, to either do nothing or to uh, convert the insert into an update instead. 
the on conflict takes uh, either a list of keys or a constraint, a name constraint that could possibly conflict. And if you do an update, it's often worth uh, having a where clause for the do update, where you can check that there is actually an effective change at all. Uh, remember that an update in Postgres because of multiversion concurrency is pretty much a delete and an insert. So if you do an update where you effectively change nothing, you're still uh, causing writes. So uh, if you do on conflict the update, uh, you should pretty much always have a where clause for it. In the example on the uh, right, we use the uh, very simple table we created on the left here, just uh, two users that we then attempt um, to uh, first insert and then uh, upsert. So in the uh, first uh, execution of this prepared statement that we parameterize, uh, what will happen is, of course, that the uh, insert happens. And then on the second invocation here, we see that we actually get nothing back. Uh, and that's because on the uh, second invocation, we do an update that happens to set exactly the same values. So the insert on conflict action effectively becomes do nothing, and that will not return anything. So if you do want to uh, get back what you either inserted or absurded in case you have some occasionally derived uh, ID, for example. Uh, you can use uh, a trick like this where you define a common table expression, uh, which we do with maybe absurded here. And that essentially becomes a table of one or zero rows. And then we essentially do a select from, from that. And if it did not return anything, then select from the uh, underlying table, which we know at this point has to have something already. Uh, and by doing that, we, we do always get uh, data back. I'll put this in a bigger context later to see why this can be quite useful. Uh, one thing to note with this union all limit one trick is that the uh, second union arm here is actually not executed at all if, uh, if the first part of the union returns something. Uh, note that you need to specify union all for this and not just union, because the union without all will need to pull in all the possible uh, rows from all the union arms to then do the deduplication. Over the last decade or so, Postgres has gained a lot of powerful JSON features. In the example on the right, we create a table where we define the metadata column to be of type JSON. This lets us store a JSON blob in this column, and Postgres will validate that it is indeed valid JSON. It will only validate conformity. It cannot be combined with a JSON schema in Postgres itself. And I'd uh, recommend using this uh, carefully. It can be very useful to be able to store arbitrary schema-less uh, data inside Postgres, but it's not a replacement for having proper schemas on most things. So having JSON typed columns or data, we can do uh, JSON aggregates on them. The example on the right show two example, one where we just create an array aggregate of all the uh, JSON blobs, and a second one where we compose an object with uh, one column providing the key. And these aggregates can, of course, be chained and so on, which we'll have a quick look at. There is an increasing amount of GraphQL implementations that build on top of Postgres, where you can uh, compose GraphQL queries, where the engine will do a single round trip to Postgres and, and pull out different kinds of data according to the query. Uh, 
and the common table expressions we've discussed in combination with uh, aggregates on nested JSON things are how these GraphQL engines tend to wire up their queries. There's uh, a new keyword in here, uh, it's uh, lateral. A uh, lateral join is pretty much like a for each, for each row uh, that you're joining in laterally, do a query per row that then gets to reference the, the row that you're executing based on. And this is very often useful to do uh, an aggregate on something else based on the row that you're currently uh, referencing. So in this example, we are uh, pulling out of the users table, and then we're doing a lateral join that composes a JSON object aggregate based on data in a different table. So that in turn uh, returns a single JSON object that then get composed into this uh, top level object through this JSON build object. So this can be done uh, recursively in multiple layers for different kinds of data. And this is what uh, GraphQL implementations often uh, build. Uh, Postgres's JSON support can be very powerful when composing object graphs to get out of Postgres, but they can also be useful when you have an object graph that you need to store in Postgres somehow. So over the next uh, several slides, we're going to compose a query that does the upsert part of uh, what's shown on the right. So we, we have a simple example where we have two tables, uh, users and their settings. And we want to have a query that takes one argument, which is a list of uh, JSON objects. And then we want to absert both users and user settings. So whether the user already exists or does not and a new user ID needs to be associated, we want to uh, be able to upsert both user and user settings for several users in, in one query here. So the JSON blob, the array of objects shown on the left, becomes the argument to this uh, table expression that essentially converts an a list of JSON objects to a set of records that we can then uh, join or do actions based on. So the orange hair essentially explodes the uh, list of JSON objects to proper records. Then in purple, we reference those records and uh, attempt to absurd them into users. And this is a little bit lengthy because we have the same case we mentioned earlier, where if the on conflict ends up not doing anything, then we don't get any data back. So in uh, this case, we need to build further on the users that may or may not exist because we are going to also do something with the settings table. So using the same trick as earlier, that I show in the absurd, we can do uh, union all, where here we essentially go, give me all the users that we either created or changed, and also just get me the record for the users we did not change, but happened to be in the list of object, uh, and uh, uh, return those. And uh, in the example in the bottom right, we now see that even if we run exactly the same query twice, we now get back uh, all the users. So that is useful when we then want to uh, touch a different table. So here we essentially go, well, for all the users involved, whether they were inserted or not, we may have some settings to absurd in this table. So this essentially does that. Uh, so this becomes a somewhat lengthy query, but uh, what we achieve then is that for a single 
parameter that is a list of JSON objects. We observed a first one table and whether or not that actually did anything, we also observed uh, a second table uh, in a single round trip to Postgres. Postgres provides a lot of tools to uh, enable downstream consumers to quickly be notified that something has changed or to uh, coordinate who exactly picks up processing certain background tasks. That is not to say that you should replace all your queuing solutions with Postgres, but if you have a service where the jobs involve doing things out of Postgres anyway, uh, these can be uh, worth looking into. There is a lot of nuance here uh, that is covered in the in-depth material that I'll link to, uh, but very briefly, uh, Notify and Listen is a combination where you can register an asynchronous callback to be uh, notified uh, between transactions. So if there is a table and you want to be notified whenever it uh, has at least one change of interest, uh, you can be notified and then immediately uh, do a query to pick up that work. Uh, this can be an alternative to uh, polling uh, several times a second. So listen is, is what you do in the client to uh, be notified. And uh, notify is what you would typically define a trigger to uh, make sure it happens. Uh, notifications are delivered between transactions and only after changes have been synchronously replicated if uh, you use that. An advisory lock is an explicit lock that can last across transactions. It can be used as a super simple uh, leader election uh, if what you need to do is go through Postgres anyway. I'm not saying you should replace all your coordination things with Postgres, but it can be worth uh, being aware of this uh, possibility. Uh, so the, the locks are essentially a 64-bit uh, integer, uh, so you need to uh, translate your lock name uh, to uh, the 64-bit space somehow. Combined with uh, Notify and Listen and Advisor locks, if you are uh, picking up uh, items from a queue essentially, it's worth uh, being aware of skip locked. So the query in the bottom uh, picks an item that no other worker has uh, a lock on. Um, so for update and skip locked can be very useful combinations. That is uh, what I had for today. I hope I have enticed you to uh, want to learn more of at least uh, some of the things I've covered. I know I've kind of only scratched the surface and gone very quickly through a lot of different things. That was uh, the, the point. The uh, links here um, and the QR code all link to the same post, which is chock full of links to high quality posts and documentation and presentations and interactive learning things that cover all these things in a lot more depth. Uh, in the unlikely event, Medium changes the link on me between publication and uh, be recording this, you can discover the blog post through medium.com slash Cognite. That's uh, Cognite's uh, tech blog, where this gets posted. If you have any questions or feedback, uh, please tweet me at uh, Alex Brasetvik. I hope you enjoyed the recording. I uh, hope to see you next year and stay healthy. Thanks.